Hello guys, Abel here. Welcome back to another video. Hopefully the lighting is good enough. Um, secondly, I have all kinds of tools on my hand to wipe my face and also my lips if it happened to turn purple from this amazing treat that I'm sipping on. Secondly, uh, I'm just past a very satisfying hunt because I managed to finally hunt down a fly that was flying around here. I normally am not one of those people that is insistent on hunting down insects around the house because whatever, I mean, less killing is usually better than more killing, but this one was some lunatic flight. Seriously, it was not stopping even for a second. It was like... So, like, I actually could not have recorded this video from the fly, so unfortunately it had to go, and um, I mean, not, not to go into, like, nasty details, but uh, it was kind of cool. It was flying, and... In its flight, I actually hit it with this uh, croc thingy. Um, not saying that I'm super athletic, but um, I'm kind of super athletic. Anyways, uh, I will be talking about some fat loss stuff now. And there's another fly. Oh, for fuck's sake. It's not the same one. Please tell me it's not the same one. You know what? I'll let it live for a minute. Um, so some fat loss stuff. I've been talking about a lot of training stuff lately, but uh, it's summer. And actually, it's a little bit more relevant for me to talk about fat loss stuff because I'm kind of in the middle. Well, luckily, not in the middle anymore. More so the tail end of a pretty big fat loss phase. It has gone by without me even noticing it. And this is not me overselling how successful I was at this fat loss process. It was really just something that I didn't invest a lot of thought into. And I guess this is one of the hallmarks of being into this whole fitness thing for a very long time. And actively working on bettering your skills and competence level and knowledge is that you get really, really efficient and proficient at fat loss. And that does not only entail being super proficient at hitting your macros and very strict with hitting your macros and estimating your macros or being more disciplined than ever. It's actually quite the opposite. It's actually that you're able to do it with such a chill, relaxed mindset and without really stressing over the whole thing to an extent that you really couldn't have imagined doing so before. And, and fuck, the fly lives. You know what? This is going to be one long battle tonight, I have a feeling. So yes, uh, the point is, it's not only that I'm more proficient from a strategic standpoint, but it's also that... I'm able to be just so much more relaxed and chill about the whole thing. Earlier on, I, I never would have thought that this could be possible. And basically, this is what I want to give you a couple of tips about today. Now, um, what have I achieved during this fat loss process so far? Well, I lost approximately a good 15 kilos. So when I started, I was you know, upwards of like 103, 105 kilos or something like that. Now I'm down very close to 90 kilos. I actually think it looks pretty good. I'll show you some pictures. I was pretty freaking gigantic at the peak. I was sort of doing a bulk and by the end of it, it just um, turned into a bit of a YOLO experience, which was, it was certainly not as useful from a muscle building perspective as an actual good structured bulk would have been. But from a fitness life lessons learned perspective, it was equally useful, maybe even more useful. So what has been my actual strategy for this cut? Well, I basically followed the guideline that I give myself always these days, except for a couple of cases where I really attempt to get super, super lean. And that simple guideline is this, eat as little as you can based on your appetite. Now, that is very vague. And of course, there is a certain structure that I follow, certain rules that I follow when it comes to timing of meals, picking certain foods and what foods I'm avoiding. At this point, I not only know my body very well, but I also know my own brain very well. I know what those rules are that I just basically always need to follow. Otherwise, I'm going to get myself in trouble and I'm going to be overeating. I also know what those rules are, which it's Ideally, I will try to adhere to those, but I can break them here and there and probably it's still going to be okay. Uh, and I also know those which just really don't matter. Like I, I could try to be super strict with those things, but it just does not seem to make a difference for me. And this is partly a knowledge thing, but it's also partly just a knowing thyself thing. This is something that I think most of you will get to eventually. 
if you spend enough time in this whole fitness game and also if you spend that time attentively. A lot of the people that I know, a lot of the people that reach out to me for coaching, what I tend to piece together from the stories that they are telling me is that, yes, they spent a lot of time in fitness, but they have been sort of just compulsively going through certain patterns. They had a goal in mind. They progressed towards that goal for a while. They failed that goal for one reason or another. They felt really bad about that. Then they attempted to reach the same goal in the same manner that they did before, not because they thought it through rationally and they concluded that, yes, indeed, this is probably the best way to do it because well, if I tried it this way and it failed miserably, then probably the best idea is to try it the same way again. But it's because these decisions were emotional decisions and fear-based decisions and guilt-driven decisions, not so much rational, strategic decisions. And so when you go through your fitness journey like that, unfortunately, not only is it bad because you will be much less likely to actually achieve your goals, but also because you will be missing out on a lot of learning opportunities. With other people, though, the issue could be the opposite as far as why they are not learning these useful lessons. It might be because they are just too gifted or to put it in a, another way, they are not cursed enough to where they really would have had to look for any kind of alternative, creative, kind of outside of the box type solutions because simply just applying good old conventional hard work and effort was always enough to overcome anything. Of course, it could be that these people have just such hard work ability that is beyond what most of us are capable of. Well, in that case, that is their gift. So I don't have that gift. I can work hard, but not that hard. So I had to be a bit clever about things. And um, either way, you get the point. You will be hearing some clever shit in this video. So the first tip, a very basic one, but I feel like this is one of those things that need to be said again and again, is that if you're really serious about your fat loss goal and your weight loss goal, whatever, maybe you even have some kind of a deadline that you're racing towards, then to really show just how committed you are, I would say as a first step, get rid of as much of the crap in your household and in your general food environment as possible. In some cases, this might be very easy. It might just be a matter of throwing some stuff out. But in some cases, it might be much more difficult because you might need to have some uncomfortable conversations with some people in your household. It seems like an obvious thing, but a lot of people have this mindset of, well, I already bought these things, so I don't want to throw them out. Well, one way or, or another, you are planning on throwing it out. Either it's going to go to the toilet, it's just you are going to be the middleman, or at the very least, you are planning to lose those fat cells where you're going to be storing that stuff. So it is probably much, much easier to just get rid of it. Now, of course, this assumes that you even have the strategy where you would not be including these things while fitting them into your macros. So if you're like me, I plan to just eat more satiating foods and I'm not tempting myself with these junk stuff, barring some unique scenarios like going out or maybe there is some, whatever, a wedding or someone just had their kid born and then we go over to celebrate, then okay, I will probably be eating some stuff which I wouldn't regularly, even on my diet. But at home in the house, I'm not going to be consuming any of that stuff. If you're like that, then I would say taking care of your food environment and being quite merciless about it is pretty important. Now, if you're one of those people who is doing if it fits your macro, so you're tracking down and counting everything, and you're able to fit these things in moderation into your diet, then okay, great, that's a different strategy, then this point does not apply to you. The second tip that I would share with you is consider front loading the toughest part of the diet. By that, I mean, Instead of doing what a lot of people tend to do, which is getting into the diet and then initially being very sloppy about it, and then as the diet progresses, pushing harder and harder and harder, and then by the time they actually finish with the diet, they are seriously starving themselves. Instead of that, actually try to do the opposite. In the beginning, when you have plenty of body fat, your body is very well able to actually handle that deficit and even larger deficits. And then as you're getting leaner and your body is less and less tolerant to those large deficits, then try to ease up. So by the time you're finishing with the diet and you're actually quite nice and lean, then you might be in a quite small deficit, maybe only losing half a percent of your body weight or less per week. And actually 
relatively speaking, the diet is not going to be that effortful at that time. It's just going to be a waiting game and a test of patience at that point, but not a constant battle against hunger, not being able to fall asleep at night because you're thinking and dreaming about food and your stomach is so damn empty that even just from a, a physical standpoint, it would be really difficult to fall asleep. Instead of going through all that misery, try to go into it hard, really push in the beginning, lose upwards of 1.5 to maybe in some cases even 3% of your body weight per week and then gradually taper it down. Like I will often with my clients push pretty damn hard actually for the first two, three weeks. At that point, we reevaluate and depending on how well it was tolerated, how things went, we might prolong the larger deficit period a little bit if we both feel like this is a good idea. I would say consider doing this. I would say it's at least worth a shot. If you haven't done it this way before, maybe try it this time. Now, in practice, it doesn't always work this well. This sounds good in theory, and when it works in practice, it's wonderful. There are definitely times when it just doesn't work this well in practice, and that is simply because there is a reason why people gravitate towards the more conventional approach, which is that they are pushing harder and harder as the diet is progressing. And that is because they are pushing harder at those points because they are more motivated to push because they are starting to see their results. When you actually see that, okay, I'm starting to get a shape. I'm starting to get pretty nice and lean looking. Oh my God, like how much more can I squeeze out of this whole dieting process? But at the same time, I'm super fed up because I've been doing this for months. So, okay, I'm, I'm going to really start pushing crazy hard. When you're really motivated, I mean, you can take on some crazy, crazy difficult stuff, some things that you wouldn't even imagine that you could take on. That is certainly the case with dieting. Well, people are much more so like that when they are closer to the tail end of the diet. In the beginning, I mean, you cannot even really tell if you're losing weight or not. Many times you're actually going through this skinny fat phase where you lost some glycogen and, and water and gut content and, and muscle fullness. So you kind of just seem deflated and soft. You haven't lost enough fat yet so that you would actually see the fruits of your fat loss labor. So you actually just look like a smaller, more deflated version of yourself with less muscle fullness and not so much visibly leaner. That is not a very motivating place to be. So at that point, even though you might theoretically understand that, okay, it would be good to go through the larger deficit periods now, you just don't have the mental bandwidth yet to really apply yourself. And what people actually often do in this case is that they are just really lax about the whole thing. So they will cheat on the diet a bit too much. They are way too loosey-goosey with eating out and they're going over their allocated macros and they're not really sticking with the diet structure that they came up with. And so the beginning of the diet, which could actually be from a physical standpoint the easiest, often just drags out for way too long. So something that could have been accomplished in two weeks will be accomplished in like six. That is not an uncommon thing that I see, unfortunately. Because that's the case, and if you're one of those people for whom that's the case, then I would say that there is a right and wrong way to go about this. The right way to go about this is that you're not making this period miserable. Because often it is actually miserable. While people are being loosey-goosey and they're not really making progress, they will often beat themselves up and they will constantly be in this limbo of, okay, I should be dieting hard. I should be pushing it in the beginning. Well, God damn it, I didn't push it today. And then today. And then today. Well, this whole week and the week after. But okay, but I really should be doing it. So next week I'm going to be doing it from Monday on. Well, Monday didn't go well. And then Tuesday. So basically they're constantly feeling like shit about themselves because they are not adhering to their own plan. On the other hand, they are not making progress. Like if you're feeling bad in any way, then at least have something positive happen to your body, right? If you're feeling guilty about dieting, that guilt is a pretty negative emotion. If your diet and your body is making you feel these negative stuff, then at least get results. But no, instead, you are getting all the bad mentally and you're getting none of the good physically. So you're not getting leaner and you're feeling like shit. Well, I would say that if you are going to be not getting results very quickly, then at least enjoy yourself more, then at least have a good time. And so I think the alternative of this not so ideal approach is to use the foot in the door approach. 
I think bodybuilders traditionally called this the hardening phase, which basically just refers to the fact that I'm not dieting yet, but I'm making a couple of simple, big picture, fundamental, qualitative changes to my lifestyle, which is then going to make it easier to really transition into the actual diet. So you're cleaning up your diet a little bit, you're switching to more satiating foods, you're stopping the mindless snacking, maybe you're making that a rule, like, okay, three or four meals, I'm not gonna track anything, I'm, I'm not going to be super strict with the quantities and let alone measurements, but I'm going to make those meals I guess cleaner, quote unquote, so more whole foods, more filling foods, higher protein, less of the non-functional or redundant carb and fat sources which serve no real purpose. I'm going to be using once again the sweetener and not some caloric sweetener, although I think that's less and less common anyway, but you know, I'm going to be using the zero calorie or close to zero calorie spray and not oil when I'm cooking, any kind of um, nutritive beverage or caloric beverage, then I'm going to be switching to the zero version. And I'm not going to be snacking in between meals. Maybe that's my only rule with eating out because that only happens once or twice a week. I'm not going to be implementing changes yet. So I'm just going to be making my diet a little bit more adult-like. I guess you could also look at it that way. This foot in the door approach is nice because it is definitely not stressful. You could totally say that this is not even really dieting. This is just being a bit more responsible with your food, which I think is perfectly appropriate at any point of the year. If this burns you out mentally or whatever, I mean, dude, you're burning out too easily. Like you need to toughen the hell up a little bit. And while doing this, odds are you're going to be losing some fat already. Because depending on how sloppy you were beforehand, this is going to already accomplish quite a bit because this is already a significant change if we are being real. So start with that, but you're not really in a dieting mindset at this point. You're basically, you can almost view it as kind of a, um, a self-development, self-improvement type of move. So approach it like that, as opposed to, okay, like I'm doing the diet, like I'm super hardcore. Well, it just happens to be the case that I'm not getting any fat loss results because I keep freaking myself out. Like I'm putting this whole pressure on myself that I should be dieting super hard, but at the same time, I'm not motivated. I have all these temptations and the good old bulking lifestyle or just plain old sloppy lifestyle is calling me like the song of the sirens. And so I just cannot adhere to what I think I should be adhering to. That is just a really, really negative, destructive place to be. So try to not fall into that trap because really that's what I see with a lot of people. That's how people end up in this place where, okay, it has been six months. And if I'm being honest, I lost an amount of weight that I really could have lost in two months. But mentally, my God, I feel like it's been forever. It's been three months, feels like 90. This was a Jesus Christ Superstar reference. Let me know if you picked it up. Okay, next one. It's a very simple one. Super not a big deal. I'm super not a genius for this. Yet at the same time, I think it could be very helpful to a lot of you. And this is about step counts and activity levels. More and more people use some kind of a step tracker and activity tracker, which is fantastic. Step counts really do work or using that as a means of expending more energy and modulating that depending on what your goals are. It really works. It's fantastic. General rule of thumb, 2000 steps is roughly hundred extra calories. So if you want to burn 400 more calories, then you know, go from 5,000 steps to about 10,000, then it's probably going to do it. Will that do it? Wait, uh, so that, that's, that's 5,000 steps. 5,000 divided by 2,000 is 200. That's not going to do it, you see? That's what I said the first time around as well. So if you currently do 2,000 steps a day or 5,000 steps a day, and you add 8,000 to it, that would be 13,000. That might actually get you there. And the thing is, 5,000 is actually a pretty common step count, so it's not a really bad example. And 13,000, that's, that's a lot of steps, but it's still not ridiculous. I would say that up to 15,000 is something that can still be done by just lifestyle alterations. I would say that's pushing it, though. That like that, Those would have to be some big lifestyle alterations. I would say if you cannot get 5,000 steps a day, then you're just, you're just too sloppy. You have no excuses unless you're like, you know, injured or something severely in your lower body. 7,000, I think, is a very good sweet spot for most people. I think most people should be able to accomplish that without having this gigantic, dedicated 
walking session in the middle of the day. I think if they are just structurally willing to rearrange their days a little bit, I think most people should be able to get 7,000 steps a day. And then 10,000, I think it is fantastic. If you're able to do that, it's a little bit more difficult than 7,000, but not by much. If you're able to do that, amazing. Now, the thing is that I talk about restructuring your day and implementing these lifestyle changes as if it's really not too much to ask. But for a lot of people, it seems like it is in practice, because what I tend to see is that despite this general recommendation that I try to give out, most people will still approach increasing their step count as a cardio session, as if there is no difference. So at one point, their alarm is going off maybe, and then, okay, it's time to go for a walk. The thing is, if you can do it this way, then that's great. And I would say I commend you for it because it shows that you have great willpower. Because if that's how you're approaching it, then it means that you wouldn't be doing it otherwise because it's probably just not that pleasant for you to go for a walk. A lot of people go for walks anyway because they just enjoy doing it. Like that's part of their evening meditative routine. If you're one of those people, fantastic. But then you're not one of those people. Otherwise, you wouldn't need an alarm that reminds you. So I would say that a much, much easier way to do this is to try to make these walks functional, something with a purpose, such as going to a grocery store or sorting out something which previously you did with car. Maybe now you can do it by foot and then make that a hard rule. So try to make that the point of the habit change. It's not about walking and about getting in more steps. It's about making that a habit that, okay, like this one is not an option from now on by car, unless there is X, Y conditions. So it's one of these if then statements. So, all right, guys, I'm very sorry. As you can see, I teleported into the future. The lighting changed. I have a hat on. The sun is up, although you cannot see it, but you can assume it perhaps. Uh, the audio storage space got filled up. So I basically lost a good 27 minutes of footage which uh, made me very, very, very upset. And yeah, the, the good side of this is that I made a couple of really horrendous dead jokes yesterday. What I was saying essentially is that you wanna make these walks functional. I think humans inherently have an issue doing things just for the sake of it, except for things that provide an amount of hedonic pleasure and instant gratification that is making it worthwhile. But when it's about some goal that you have kind of further removed in the future that you're doing this for, I think we have an issue committing to things like walks, which are, they can be enjoyable, but it's not the kind of instantaneous gratification and pleasure that, I don't know, playing video games would be or eating would be or kex would be, which is, uh, anyway, that, that was not one of the dead jokes. By the way, I made this Turkish coffee kind of thing. Um, we will see how disgusting it is. No, I don't even really feel the difference. So a couple of examples here could be, let's say you have a dog. I mean, this is a, a bit too obvious of an example, although looking at a lot of our neighbors, apparently it's not, but you know, I have a dog. I haven't taken the dog for a walk in months. So how about I become a good doggy daddy or doggy mommy? And I'm actually going to go for a half an hour walk with that dog twice a day, or even a 15 minute walk with that dog twice a day. You have absolutely no idea, by the way, how happy that makes your dog. Also, let me just say, if you have neighbors and they are annoyed as hell, which they are, if your dog is constantly barking, your dog is probably going to be happier and not bark as much because it's not going to be bored as often if you actually take your dog for walks. Uh, that's a side note, but it could also be a couple of these, you know, if then statements, like I mentioned. So, or did I mention, I don't know if that still made it to the previous recording. So when you go to a grocery store, which might be, I don't know, like 50 minutes of walking away, then just commit to it that, okay, to this grocery store, I'm always going by foot unless it's some act of God type situation. For example, well, easy example, if it's raining, then okay, in those cases, I'm gonna be taking my car or I'm gonna be going by car, but otherwise, this is always a walk. Um, if you're living in the Netherlands or in England, this is cheating, okay? Then the rain is not good enough of an excuse because you will be not walking like 60% of the time. Also, if you live in Australia, then having giant snakes and giant lizards and 
shark topuses and tyrannosaurus rexes around is also cheating okay because you will always have them around so just commit to it and walk no matter what in those cases or at least use another excuse but you can use these if then statements so you don't need to be committing to something like like at all costs no matter what like there can be exceptions but try to make that the habit change instead of saying okay i'm gonna go for this half an hour walk every evening at 8 p.m say okay I already have this habit in place. I'm going to the store. I'm just going to restructure that habit a little bit. So the habit is the same. It's just implemented in a slightly different way. And that's going to be much, much easier to commit to. Actually, I will also say that this was one of the reasons why bulk shopping was something that I just refused to commit to for the longest time. Because I actually enjoy the fact that some sort of shopping I needed to do every day. Because that by itself guaranteed a good you know, 20 minutes total of walking, even if I was completely sedentary for the rest of the day, at least there was that. This is also why it was so great for me that I had this gym like 10 minutes of walking away, because just by walking there and back, there was already like, you know, a, a good 2000 steps. Plus being in the gym, of course, is, is also going to get me some step count just by itself, because, you know, walking around in the gym between sets and in between the machines and, and everything is going to get me some extra steps but that walk to the gym was a really nice part of my routine then I kind of turned into a, a piece of shit and started using my wife's car luckily uh, that is no longer going to be the case um, long story short the car broke down I happened to be the unfortunate fucker who was driving that car when that happened so we kind of got into an argument and I committed to never use her car again um, very dramatic, but um, I was so damn serious about it that now I cannot back out of it because <laughs> because then I'm going to be making a fool of myself. So yes, I'm, I'm not driving to the gym ever again and I'm definitely not buying myself a car here. So um, it was either that car or no car. Um, did you really need to know this? Anyways, so yes, have little routines in your day, have little things that you're already doing and it doesn't take like the implementation of a whole new habit and a whole new set of behaviors that you need to implement. You can just take this thing that is already in place. Okay, how can I tweak this a little bit to make it a bit more fitness lifestyle friendly and more conducive to my fitness goals? And by the way, like think outside the box, like there are lots and lots of examples. I know, for example, that people who live in these tall buildings and it's kind of a pain in the butt to take down the trash and Maybe you are the person who is assigned with that task and your family members or roommates are always nagging you like, hey, like, why are you waiting so long before you take down the trash? Why are you waiting four days and you're just collecting the trash bags in front of the door? And when someone comes here, our house looks like some kind of a dumpster. It's understandable because, yeah, I'm sure it can be a pain in the butt. But this could be a really cool opportunity for you to get in some more movement and some more steps. So just commit to it. Like, okay, every night I'm going to take down the trash. If it's a tall building, I mean, that could be quite a few steps and everybody wins. Your roommates or your family members or significant other, whoever is going to be happier for it. And you're that much closer to your daily step count goal. Um, also, so again, just to reiterate, I don't know if it made it to the previous recording that got lost, but 7,000 steps is a nice kind of middle of the road, kind of middle ground number that a lot of people can achieve even without overhauling their whole lifestyle. 10,000 is great. 5,000 is the bare minimum, I would say. And in the meantime, I remember that it did make it to the previous recording. So not going to be super detailed about this reiteration. All right, um, one or two points left. I'll see how smoothly I get through the next point. And then, um, yeah, I may make a few more points. Now, the next point, uh, and, and this is the last point, by the way, it might branch into uh, a couple of sub points we will see. But uh, this next point is something that might seem like a bit of a fancy, more advanced kind of strategy. In my mind, it's really not. But to some of you, it might seem that way. For some of you, this might be completely irrelevant because you might already be doing this. But I would say that if you're someone who is always tracking calories and macros, consider this time not doing it and getting lean without that. This might seem very scary, but the thing is I have implemented this with a number of clients. And honestly, I'm yet to see one person who fails with this. And I really do mean that. And I'm talking about people who were really concerned, who were really neurotic before, even the sort of people who were not only neurotic, but I, 
was even somewhat fearful, like, like what if X, Y happens? So I was very conservative with how I implemented it because they seemed like the types of people who were so attentive to every single little detail that it actually, like I mentioned in the beginning, maybe prevented them from actually learning about themselves and actually observing why certain things work what are their true preferences, not what they think their preferences should be in theory, but what are things that actually make the process easier for them. A lot of people actually fail to observe these things, even with people where I had the intuition that they might be like this, even they succeeded. Fat loss, especially. So fat loss, uniquely so, seems to be the time where people just have a lot of success implementing this. And even people who were super, super fearful of implementing this, even people who were so attentive to every single detail and measuring everything down to the gram, and this attention to detail definitely turned into some neurosis in these cases. And you could even be a bit fearful for them at this point that, okay, maybe they were so attentive that they actually failed to learn those important lessons about themselves, like I explained in the beginning. Well, even in those cases, they succeeded very, very impressively. They often lost even more fat, more efficiently. They had an easier time getting into those larger deficits as evidenced by their rate of weight loss. And I really think that actually more aggressive fat loss phases are easier to implement without tracking calories and macros than anything else. It's definitely much, much easier than bulking, lean bulking. It's about as difficult as maintenance, I would say, at least if you're thinking about maintenance the way I do, which is sort of hovering around a certain range, not precisely trying to maintain this specific weight, like down to the 0, 0.0 value. So making fat loss happen while auto-regulating your energy intake and eating based on appetite and based on a certain structure that you set for yourself with regards to food choices and meal structuring and how you structure the meals around your day, how you're timing your nutrients and all of those things. Not tracking calories and macros is extremely viable if you want to lose fat efficiently. Oftentimes the bigger challenge is actually moderating that deficit later and going into a smaller deficit when it's needed or transitioning into maintenance or lean bulking smoothly, that can be much, much trickier without tracking calories and or macros. And so I would say, consider giving this a go. And I'm fairly confident that you will be very pleasantly surprised. Not only do I say this because I actually think you could be losing fat faster, not only am I saying this because I think that it's a very, very valuable lesson to learn that, okay, you can track calories and macros if it gives you a sense of comfort, if you even find it enjoyable, because there are definitely those people, even then, I think it's important to have that self-belief that, okay, I could actually do this if I wanted to. Then if you don't do it, then that's completely fine because then you just don't want to do it. However, I always say that if you've been tracking calories for a very long time, that's fine. But if I ask you what would happen if I took away your ability to track things down, and then if your answer was, well, I would balloon up 15 pounds, that's an issue because that means that you don't have that self-belief. And why don't you have that self-belief? Well, it's probably because even you know that you didn't really learn as much during this whole tracking process as you should have. But also the benefit is that this actually can make the fat loss process not just more time efficient, but also a lot more energy efficient or effort efficient. Basically, not knowing exactly how many calories you're eating and hitting a larger deficit that way is much, much easier for a lot of people than actually tracking it down and then following those lower numbers. For an 80 kilo plus guy to know that they are eating less than 2000 calories is just this mind F. It's something that is messing with their heads. Maybe normally they would be three out of 10 hungry on a 10 point scale, not that I advocate tracking your fullness sensitivity this way, but like if we were to quantify it, normally this would be a three out of 10. But as soon as they know that, okay, I'm only eating 1800 calories, it becomes a six out of 10 or a seven out of 10. This is a very real thing. Our brains are very fallible and we can be very easily nocebo this way. And so you can take away a lot of that nocebo by simply just not knowing what that number is. Now, of course, if you're not going to be tracking calories, then it's important to track 
results or track the effectiveness of what you're doing. So whereas normally maybe it was okay if you didn't actually track your body weight even, but you did track calories because you know from experience that, okay, with this step count and this and this many days in the gym and with this calorie intake, I was losing roughly, I don't know, two pounds a week or something then as long as you're eating the same number of calories roughly and your activity levels are roughly the same and your lifestyle is roughly the same, I don't think it's unreasonable to not track your body weight because, I mean, surely it's going to work the same way again, more or less. If you're not tracking your calories, then it is pretty important to track your body weight for a while if the deficit is larger and you can tell that, okay, like I'm pretty damn hungry and I'm definitely in a deficit, then... I guess you could just rely on the mirror or even just bodily sensations because that basically tells you that you're in a deficit. But over time, it becomes more and more important, especially as you get kind of deeper into the diet and you will have lost quite a bit of weight already and quite a bit of fat already. You cannot rely on your body signals as much at that point simply because you will be more and more expected to be hungry pretty much no matter what, and more food focus pretty much no matter what. So at that point, you probably do want to track body weight, if possible, also waist measurements, so waist girth. And based on that, you will actually know and verify it for yourself that, okay, my diet is actually working. I am indeed in the type of or magnitude of deficit that I planned on being in. Of course, this is also a skill that you learn over time and that you master over time. Just like with anything, at first, you're not going to be that amazing at it. Initially, you will perhaps make a couple of rookie mistakes. In my experience, actually, even with that, it's not common at all to not succeed with the diet. So the diet is still going to be working. It's actually more common, once again, to lose weight too fast rather than not losing enough or not losing at all. But you might be making your initial mistakes. I definitely had some big mistakes that I made in the beginning, but I would say that this is the sort of dietary strategy that is going to take you from effective to effective and more pleasant and then even more pleasant and even more effortless. Like this is just going to keep getting better because once again, you will learn a lot more about how your body ticks and what food choices work for you the best, what sort of timing patterns work for you the best and simply what little perhaps unconventional behaviors are most conducive to your success in the most time efficient and once again also effort sparing manner i for example know for myself that okay there are certain foods that i always need to keep out of the house because like that is just a recipe for disaster there are those things where like okay probably it's better if i don't keep it in the house but um, you know probably i can get away with it actually But if God forbid, like let's say my wife buys a whole bunch of it and it's around, I'm probably going to be fine still. And then there are my go-to foods, which over time I also kind of had to find out for myself. As you're starting to figure yourself out, the more second nature all of this becomes. And eventually it will just seem weird that this was ever a fearful proposition for you. A lot of people just over mystify this whole thing way too much. They think that this is some constant meditative practice and you need to be asking yourself after every bite whether you're still hungry for the next one. Well, I can assure you that I've never done that and never will. (laughs) Okay, I sit down and when I feel full, I stop eating and noticing when I'm full is not some magical moment when that happens. It just it's just kind of pretty obvious. It's about as obvious as noticing that you need to go to the toilet. And one last, last thing, just because why not? So just in the same way as tracking calories is not necessary to get results in the here and now. And just as I mentioned that you can be quite chill about this whole process and still get good results. And at the same time, I also mentioned that front loading the deficit and pushing the calorie deficit and the low calories more in the beginning of the diet and then easing up later is a good strategy. There is another strategy that I like even more at this point, and that is basically auto-regulated structuring of the various phases of a diet, which is a very fancy way of putting it. But basically what I'm talking about is that I don't plan these things out in super great detail for myself anymore. So I don't necessarily structure it in some super, super elaborate way that, okay, like I'm going to be pushing it this hard for the first two weeks and then slightly easier for the next two weeks and even easier for the two weeks after. 
that's sort of how I go about it with clients, just because structure is important when you're not quite sure what the person is and isn't apt to do yet. But for myself, the way I go about it is that I assess my motivation levels. I assess just how much my heart and mind is in it. There are just times when I just really don't have it in me. Um, times of feeling uninspired by the whole dieting game. These are times when I just cannot find that motivation in my brain that would justify saying no to so many options and being so stringent with the diet. And the thing is that normally this would be the sort of emotion and sort of thought process that you would need to ignore because you know that you're human and you're fallible and weak fundamentally. So normally you have to ignore these things. However, because I've experienced with myself that seemingly out of nowhere, this mindset can completely flip over and I can feel so driven that I feel like I could run through a brick wall and with dieting efforts, I can seriously take on some insane shit because I know that I'm very comfortable sort of just waiting until my muse, my diet muse comes and blesses me. And at that moment, I'm going to start pushing harder. So that's sort of what happened in this case as well. I would say that since I started cutting, I wasted away a good month. So there was one month where I basically didn't lose anything. And that was because I just felt so uninspired. The weather was constantly shit. It was always raining and it was windy. I couldn't even go for a, a not super unpleasant walk. The whole thing was just awful. There were other things going on that made me not particularly enthusiastic. And so I was just like, you know what? I'm, I'm, I'm just not going to be exerting myself that much. And so I didn't. I also didn't get results. But then this mindset just naturally started flipping more and more uh, until at one moment I just felt like, man, I could just not eat for this upcoming week. Like I, I can do anything. And then I started pushing a lot more. It didn't even feel that effortful, even though objectively on an absolute scale, I was pushing really hard. And I made a ton of progress in that month, for example. And I sort of undulate between phases like this. And of course there are in between phases as well. So it's not like all or nothing. It can be something like, okay, I'm going to be pushing, but whatever, like 0.6 kilos a week or even 0.6 pounds a week is going to be perfectly enough now. And then at other times you're not settling for anything less than 2.3 pounds per week. And I think you can auto-regulate this and it's not just your hunger that can determine how big that appropriate deficit is for you on that day, but also your mind state. Of course, once again, this assumes that you know yourself and you know that, okay, you will inevitably have those times when you will feel up to doing the hard thing, the kind of thing that now it seems like you're just trying to avoid. But if you know it about yourself that, okay, it's, it's not so much that I want to avoid it. It's just, I want to avoid it in this moment because I just don't feel up to it. So once again, th this is a matter of knowing yourself. I know that this is how I'm wired. You know, I have clients that had been with me for well, maybe up upwards of like two years at this point, maybe some of them even actually longer than two years. And with them, I, I can really nicely just tell how they tend to tick in this point. Probably I know this better about them at this point than they know this about themselves. People are wired differently, of course. Some people are just always up to be doing the super hard stuff. Other people, not so much. But for most people, I would say that they do have this kind of phasic setup. Now, how the phases exactly look like, how hard they will push in their more motivated phases and how much they will be tending towards sloppiness in their less motivated phases, that differs, of course. But... With most people, I do observe this sort of pattern where, okay, you got to pick your spots smartly. It's almost like these alarms that are supposed to wake you up when your sleep phase in that moment is the least deep so that you're not woken up by your alarm in the middle of the deepest dream. But when your sleep is kind of shallow, that's when you will wake up and it will be much, much easier to wake up. So it's, it's kind of like that, basically matching the amount of invested effort to how much effort you're likely really ready for in that moment. So I would say consider this as well. And um, yeah, guys, I would say I'm going to close it here. Uh, this was kind of a briefer, lighthearted video, although as I'm seeing it, in total, I still managed to accumulate quite a bit of raw footage time. 
But nevertheless, I hope this video was informative. Please let me know what you thought about it in the comments below. Like the video if you liked it, subscribe for more content like this. And if you're interested in working together with me in a coach client kind of format or doing a consultation with me, then um, check my website in the show description. You can see the contact from there, submit that. I'll get back to you. We will talk it over and we will see if this could be a good fit. And so, yeah, that's all I wanted to say in this video. Thanks for your attention and see you in the next video.